His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host. And our opening music was courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. And welcome back to the second half of our look at the South Hold Indian Museum. Last time out, we spoke with their incoming executive director, Jay Levinson. Today, we are getting more of the background, the history of the museum itself, some of the fascinating research they've been doing, the science that is unlocking the secrets of their collections, the archaeology of it all, with the woman who knows, their current president, and today's very special guest. Hi, I'm Lucinda Hemick, and I'm the president of the Southold Indian Museum. And I also teach science research at Longwood High School. And uh, you're going to see how those things tie in. Could you start with telling us when, when you first became involved with the museum? I got involved with the museum because I was doing some projects, uh, research projects with my science research students, and they had an interest in uh, paleo points. So the Clovis people were the first ones to come onto the Long Island. So I searched around and I said, is there a museum that might have a Clovis point? And South Old Indian Museum had a Clovis point and a Folsom point. So I went to the museum and asked to borrow them for the study, and they said yes. And that was probably 10 years ago. But I got involved with them through science, and uh, that's pretty much still my involvement. And and just to stay with that project, what were they doing ultimately with the Clovis Point? We were trying to dis- establish the provenance of the points. In other words, uh, looking at the stones and looking at the chemical composition and trying to figure out what quarry they might have come from. Did they travel a long way? Was it local stone, etc.? So it was a really interesting project, and it got them interested and me interested in using the artifacts that were already at the museum because it's such a rich source of projects. And so let's talk a little science. So you're you're at Longwood High School? Yep. So what is your background in science? What did you study? I got a PhD in uh, neurosciences, but science is science. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if you want to do any kind of science research, the important thing is to come up with interesting questions, which can be any kind of field, and then just follow them through and use all the tools available. I don't know if you're from Long Island, but what was your knowledge of Native American history on the island? Oh, I had zero knowledge. Um, I grew up in Arkansas. I went to school in uh, University of Rochester, and then I settled on Long Island when uh, my husband took a job at Stony Brook University. And he was doing his work at uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, which sort of gave me a tie-in to BNL. So with the Clovis Project about 10 years ago, of course, that kicked off an interest in uh, the local Native American history and culture and archaeology. And I was amazed that it went back 10,000 years. At, at least, right? That's a huge amount of time compared to what most people think of as a long time ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And just how have your students reacted to as they get more involved with the Native American artifacts? Well, it's great exposure because, you know, they don't really get so much in school. They get in the fourth grade curriculum, they have a required Algonquin uh, unit. And then after that, it sort of catches catch can. So it's really gotten them to be immersed in the material culture of the local Native Americans and also the opportunities that they have to ask some very interesting questions about the artifact, preparation, et cetera. So at what point did you officially become involved with the museum? Oh, I uh, joined the board shortly after that first experiment. And then I was just spending so much time there and so many projects that it sort of became natural for me to just be the president (laughs) and uh, take on some of the other duties. What are the highlights of the collection in your mind that you would tell people about? Well, I would say that we probably have the largest collection of steatite, that's soapstone pots, 
and the largest collection of restored ceramic pots, possibly in any museum in New York. It's pretty amazing. There was such a high population density on Long Island from 10,000 years ago to today that there's just a vast assortment of artifacts that can be found, especially by farmers plowing their fields. So if you go back to the potato farms, uh, this is how a lot of farmers got interested in archaeology because they were just naturally turning up artifacts. Yeah. Can you speak a little? To, we, we'd ask Jay a little bit, but um, in terms of the development of the museum, it, it dates the activities of the people, from what I understand, dates to the 20s. And then the, the physical museum in terms of like chartering and being official is later. Can, can you walk us through just the timeline of the museum? Sure. Here I go. <laughs> Um, so this started as sort of a club of East End um, archaeology buffs. They had personal collections. So in 1925, Nathaniel Booth, Bennett de Beshedon, William Griswold, Roy Latham, Elliot Brooks, Edward Vale, Charles Goddard, James Gildersleeve, and Daniel Young got together. They were meeting at each other's houses, and they were discussing their common interest in specifically Long Island Native American archaeology. Now, out of this group, there were several that were interested in doing excavations on uh, private land. Um, so amateur excavations have a long history in the United States. You could say that the first amateur archaeologist in America was Thomas Jefferson, who noticed as he was uh, digging deeper into some mounds on his land in Virginia that the artifacts were getting to be older and older. So he actually introduced the concept of studying things by strata or levels. Um, he was probably inspired by his travels in Europe where archeology span was much further advanced. Then he conducted the first scientific archeological study and published his results in the book, uh, Notes on the State of Virginia. So this group of people on Long Island were aware of certain practices in archaeology, but they were conservative and decided if we're going to do something, you know, we're going to get some advice. So they did call in state archaeologists. Getting back to the original group, on the East End especially, people are well aware of um, Roy Latham, who was an East End potato farmer. Nat Booth was the chief of the South Old Fire Department and a much-loved character. And Charles Goddard was a retired Meditook lawyer who got an interest in archaeology after he retired. So that amateur group sought out professional archaeologists to help them in their digs, and they wanted to have more opportunities for the oversight and advice. So in 1932, they founded the Long Island chapter of the New York State Archaeological Association, which remain, remains the only NYSAA chapter on Long Island. So after the forming of the chapter, they were able to easily seek help from some well-known archaeologists to investigate sites that they had discovered. Uh, Ralph Selecki was instrumental in studying Fort Korchog in Kutchog. He published a number of journal articles that compared it to other contact era forts in the Northeast. Um, Selecki achieved a lot of fame later in his career due to his work in deciphering the Neanderthal burials at the Shanidar Cave in modern Iraq. So the work by our founders, together with Selecki, resulted in Fort Korchog being placed on the National Historic Landmarks list. And I'm, I'm curious, and I don't know if you if you know or there's evidence of this. Um, so back in the 20s and 30s, when these gentlemen were, were active or starting out, what would you say was their understanding of the existing Native American population that was out there? Did they make the connection to the living descendants or were they looking at it more as just purely an archaeological uh, endeavor? Or No, they were very interested and they're very curious that one couldn't find traces of the Korchog tribe anymore, even though Fort Korchog it was a well-known site. The theory is that the last of the Korchogs were um, operating in perhaps the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, they didn't have land, and some of them were working on the local farms and just sort of couldn't be located anymore. 
But the good news was that uh, the Shinnecocks and some members of the Montauk tribe were still in the area. And right now, um, of course, you have the Shinnecock Reservation and the Uncachog Reservation. So along with their interest in collecting and artifacts, they had a very keen interest in finding out where were those people now. And, and just to, we, we talked to Jay a little bit about, um, I, I was fascinated by the smoking pipes that you have uh, that were online. In terms of the science of it, what are the the pieces in the collection that most excite you in terms of what they can tell us through study? Well, I'll say a few things because I'm not a pipe okay. expert, <laughs> but the smoking of tobacco goes back as far as um, the early to middle archaic period. So we're talking thousands of years. And what is interesting is that the type of tobacco that was grown on Long Island was of the variety uh, Nicotinia rustica. Now, this grows in our sort of sandy soil. What's interesting about that is that this plant produces 10 times the tobacco content of all of the ones that are currently being uh, grown in Virginia, et cetera. So it was definitely of a ceremonial use. And the pipes in the beginning were made of steatite or soapstone, which puts them in the archaic period. And then as you progress through to the woodland period, they started to be made of uh, ceramic. And some of the ceremonial pipes, it was important to use a material that was considered to be just sacred. So actually, we have several pipes in our collection that are made of a material called catlinite, which can only be gotten in the Northwest. So that's actually great evidence of travel and trade in obtaining the material for these pipes. You had mentioned earlier on uh, about provenance, and is are there... The collections in the museum, are they all Long Island based or are some from collected or donated? Or Oh, of course. Uh, we have the material, the collections from the founders, but many, many generous donations. And so in our upper level, we try to keep it all local Algonquin. But we do have some large donations, such as a collection of the Plains Indians. And on our lower level, we have uh, quite a bit of Mesoamerican and South American, which was the interest of a past board member. So it's kind of nice to compare, though, because if you look at the types of tools and stones and artifacts of the Northeast, it gives you a great perspective to compare them to ones from nations from around both North and South America. Have you gone back or thought back to Arkansas and, and the Native Americans there and compared I have. Uh, well, so when I was growing up there, I had no interest because I had no exposure to it. But it turns out that um, the Arkansas area has many very significant sites. And uh, the Mississippian culture goes back, of course, thousands of years. And there are some really fascinating sites that I'd like to now go back and take a look at now that I have a little better appreciation. And we had talked a little before, and you'd mentioned the um collaborations with, with Brookhaven National Lab and the BEAM, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist. So can you t- talk a little bit about the, the amount of or the type of research you can do working with more advanced equipment and, and the collections that you have? Yes. Well, the future director of our museum would combine research and education. So we at Longwood High School are members of the Brookhaven National Lab SPARC Collaboration. That stands for Student Partnerships for Advanced Research and Knowledge. The um, advantage of that is the program allows students to propose experiments, and if they get approved, they can carry them out using various beam lines at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at BNL. So that's NSLS2. So taking advantage of that, We have three different NSLS2 research projects going on right now at NSLS2 using existing site artifacts. We're asking questions like, where did the steatite come from? And it's very fascinating. We're following up on some work by Mark Tweedy, who's an archaeologist um, who advised us on this project, tracing all of the steatite back to just two quarries in Rhode Island. And we have another project where 
We're looking at uh, ceramics from 10 different sites, ranging from Ryder's Pond site in Brooklyn to um, Orient to Shelter Island, to look at the type of clay, look at the elemental analysis of the clay, and try to figure out what clay sources these different groups of people were using. You know, did they prefer a certain clay? Did they travel to get the clay? Did they use what they had? So that's really interesting. And we're also looking at uh, the possibility of uh, the existence of what's called varnished rocks on eastern Long Island. Uh, varnished rock is more associated with a hot desert environment where rocks get coated with manganese and iron, and they form a coating that then people can then scratch pictographs into. And so that lets you do something called geoarchaeology with the rocks. So we're in the early stages of just saying, we think that we have these rocks, <laughs> and you know that's a geology project. Um, so it's really, really fascinating to do these. We're currently just collecting the rest of our data. We're also converting our library into a research library where our guests can, are welcome to read and copy journal articles that are not available online. They're going back into the late 1800s. So that's a really good source of uh, research for uh, people interested in local archaeology. And just to ask you about the varnish a little more, so those would have been decorative objects from what you understand? Yes. So that is important because uh, the Native Americans were very interested in special rocks that had certain properties. So these would have been a shiny rock. They were also interested in extremely clear quartz, which was supposed to impart a spirituality, and specifically colored rocks and banded slate that have beautiful patterns on them. They would sometimes choose those type of stones to make things like atlatl weights and uh, magic stones just because of the patterns on the rocks. So they were definitely uh, rock connoisseurs. They knew their rocks. They knew exactly how to make a tool of you know, a less hard rock using a harder rock. So they really, really had to know their geology. In terms of people's exposure, especially working with students, and you mentioned in the curriculum, it's really introduced, if at all, in, in the earlier grades. How would you change or would you what, what would you suggest or like to see with the formal education of Long Island students about including some of this Native American history and science? I would love to see an elective. You know, um, a half-year elective in uh, Long Island Native American history and culture. So that could just be scheduled by the students. You know, if they were interested in that, they could take it for a half a year. And that just follows up on U.S. history, world history, etc. But it makes it more local. And it would bring the ability of the students to have that appreciation that this land has been occupied for over 10,000 years by these cultures. And just shifting somewhat, but there is a sensitivity in terms of an archaeological dig, but also sacred sites and you know the meaning of the sites. So how do you, in terms of the museum's work and mission, how do you balance the collections and any any digs or field work and and the the meaning of the sites to the the Native American peoples. Yeah, I'd be very happy to talk about that. So, when you have collections that uh, reflect a certain type of site, if you're a museum, you have to make your priority the preservation aspect. All right, so you have to work with, uh, say, Peconic Land Trust. You have to um, have exhibits that support the preservation of the sites, and you have to work with your local nations. So, for example, uh, the museum is now 100% repatriated with the Shinnecock regarding human remains. That's a very sensitive, long, detailed process, but it's done. I'm not at liberty to um, discuss any of the details of it, but we're very gratified that we were able to work with them to accomplish that. And uh, now I'll get into some of the most sacred sites on Long Island that uh, the museum has had a hand in preserving. Um, a unique feature of the terminal archaic period, which is sometimes called the transitional period, is a site called a hilltop burial. So it's really 
as far as we know, unique to Long Island. These were likely reserved for the sachems of the highest rank. So the museum founders, realizing that these were very important sites, uh, called on William Ritchie, who was the New York State archaeologist for about 25 years, to help excavate uh, certain sites in Jamesport and then Sugarloaf Hill in Southampton. So Ritchie published many articles on these sites and included them in a book summarizing this cultural period. So due to the educational efforts of the museum and many others, both Jamesport and now, just a month ago, Sugarloaf Hill sites have been preserved. Now, the Baconic Land Trust has to be given uh, most of the credit, of course, for accomplishing this preservation. The museum assists by providing our site records from the original excavations to go together with Ritchie's records to the Southampton town historian Julie Green to help interpret this site according to its features and perimeters. Great. And uh, just to talk a little bit about the the state of, of archaeology, because you, you mentioned turning your library into a research library. What, what would you like to see in terms of strengthening or emphasizing the importance of archaeology on Long Island? Well, of course, we'd love to have uh, Stony Brook University um, expand their local archaeology, Long Island archaeology programs. But, you know, that doesn't stop us from finding archaeologists to collaborate with in a useful way. So you've got to remember that around 12,000 years ago, um, Long Island and Connecticut were joined mm. <laughs> before the glacier gouged out the um, sound. So we've been successful in finding Connecticut archaeologists to help us interpret sites and uh, collaborate. So we're able to work with that, and we're also working with local archaeologists for such things as Let's say um, they're going to do an archaeological survey for a proposed development. The archaeologists contact the museum, and we look through our site records for any sites that are in that area, and we release our records to them, which is a great help for them as they do the modern-day survey, because some of these sites, uh, they might go back to the 1930s and 1940s, and, you know, they're on the list of the State Historical Preservation Office, but we have the records and the artifacts. So we're currently working with a few archaeologists on these surveys and providing information. And it, just out of curiosity, do any of your collections come from the post-contact periods? We do, yes. Um, of course, that's characterized by the presence of metal, <laughs> because there was never any metallurgy by uh, the local population, because they simply couldn't find uh, high enough quality or enough copper to do anything with. Uh, but post-contact is where you see the trading of metal from the Europeans, which was a real game changer. So uh, we have items such as small uh, metal projectile points that were literally cut out of possibly a teapot or something like that that was traded. You know, so any metal that they could get their hands on was really precious and they would uh, use it to great advantage. And Jay mentioned a little or, or mentioned that you're, you're closed for some renovation. Do you want to talk about what, what work is physically being done at the museum. And, and so if people listen to this, it should be mid-December when it's live. Um, anything you'd want people to be aware of coming up or the timeline going into the new year? Sure. Well, we plan to reopen on, uh, I guess it's December 12th. Right now, the uh, cement is curing from our porch work. We had our, our front stamps and porch worked on to bring the porch up to the level of the front door, which is our first step in ADA construction that we hope we can finish up in the spring. So we're trying to put in an external lift and a new exterior door to the lower level, which would give anyone access to either level um, and a small parking lot. So that's really going to improve our ability to get people in the building easily and also to expand our programs. And, and just in, again, going back to the collections, but what's something, it doesn't have to be of a scientific nature, but in terms of you discovering what was in the museum, and what was the coolest thing or the, something that really surprised you that it just that it was there? Well, I think the thing that strikes anybody who even visits the museum is the density of sites on Long Island and the continuity of occupation. So 
a small museum such as ours to have items from the paleo to the archaic to all the woodlands is impressive to me because you span 10,000 years uh, continuously and you can see how the progression of the differences in lifestyles goes. It's also pretty impressive to me to see how skillfully the Native Americans use their maritime resources. So this is very different from other parts of the country where there was a there came to be a great reliance on corn, et cetera. On Long Island, you sort of have a perfect opportunity to exploit uh, the fish and shellfish, et cetera. So these huge um, shell middens that we have on Long Island are, are fascinating to me too, because just like a Roman trash heap, <laughs> a shell midden can be studied from the top down and um, a collection of shell middens that we have from uh, the Glen Cove area in Nassau County yielded some artifacts that are of a type of around 6,000 years ago. So there's an, op- there's an example of um, a work area that was used from 6,000 years ago up to uh, woodland period, contact era. Now, if you could go back now, would, would you become an archaeologist instead of a neuroscientist? <laughs> I was always interested in archaeology, but, you know, in certain parts of the country, like Arkansas and the Deep South, it never really presented itself as a research opportunity or as a career. You know how when they say that when you can't see it, you can't be it? Yep. So uh, that was a situation for me. Uh, But I got interested in science pretty heavily in college. And then, of course, exploring the brain is about the coolest thing you can do. So, so I went that way. But, you know, once you become a scientist, you have a toolkit. And then you can apply that toolkit to anything because um, they say that a PhD is just a card that you carry around that says that you can educate yourself in anything when you mm-hmm. need to. Yep, you learn how to <laughs> learn. And it, it, before we wrap up, is there anything I haven't asked you or anything you want to get across about the museum that we haven't mentioned yet? Well, I did neglect to say that um, how the how the museum as a building came about. Uh, So these founders fundraised for many, many years. And finally, in 1962, they had the funds together to buy the property and the museum was built in Southold. And then at that point, everybody's collection could be brought in. And that was a great relief because, you know, you have basements, attics, etc. (laughs) So um, I'd also like to say that we have so much storage in the museum. We have so many artifacts. You're you're not going to see all of it by looking at the exhibits, but we have a great photo gallery on our website. Um, the website is southoldindianmuseum.com, and our photo gallery was generously funded by the Gardner Foundation. Yes, and I and you've graciously let us use some of those images we'll post with, with this episode so people can go and look. And, and is that an ongoing activity, the, the photographing of the collections? Yes. And uh, we would welcome any volunteers to help us with the website and the photo gallery. What's valuable about the photo gallery is if you say you go to the tools portion and you found something on the beach and you think it might be a tool, you can actually just flip through all of those images and sort of compare what you have to it. And maybe you'll figure out what kind of tool it is. That's interesting. So do you, just out of curiosity again, do, do people contact you with finds and say, hey, what I picked this up on the side of the road or in my backyard? And Definitely. All the time. People bring artifacts in and they send us pictures. So you can send us pictures through our, um, let's see, Indian Museum at optonline.net. <laughs> Please send both sides of the artifact. And then I, I'm not an archaeologist, but we have an archaeologist. <laughs> so I send those to Lisa Cordani, who is our advisor, and she will take a look at it, give her feedback, and get back to you. Great. Well, good luck or have fun with all the research and with the students, and, and hopefully we'll get some people coming out to uh, visit you in Southold. All right. Great. Thanks for having me on the podcast. And thank you again to Lucinda and to Jay before her for speaking with us. We were on Zencaster for both episodes. 
And to recap, the South Hold Indian Museum is at 1080 Main Bayview Road in South Hold, right near Sophie's. So next time you're out on the North Fork, make sure you stop in. We are posting this on December 11th, so we congratulate them on their reopening tomorrow. If you want to visit them online, they are at southholdindianmuseum.com. We will have links to related resources in our show notes. Those are at longislandhistoryproject.org. And as this will be our last episode for the year, we just want to thank everyone who has been listening. No matter where you jumped on, we appreciate everyone's support. All we ask is that you share us with a friend, dip into some of our other episodes dealing with Long Island archaeology, send those links off, post them on Facebook, send them to a friend, help us spread the word that there is a podcast out there dedicated to Long Island history. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. We hope everyone has a healthy and happy holiday. That's a wrap on 2021. But as always, thank you for listening.